and welcome to the South Cumbria North Lancashire IASH branch meeting for, uh, for July. Um, I'm sure you will have just noticed that uh, we are today recording the session. So if, uh, if I can just ask you to bear that in mind when you decide whether to have your video on or, or off, um, then that should be great. The usual housekeeping rules apply today. So if you have a question for us and you please type it in the chat bar. If you can start it with a cue, that will help us to, to pick that up from the conversation that's going back and forth between uh, individual members. So this afternoon, I am really pleased to be inviting and, and welcoming uh, Amanda and Julian Dowson. Um, now we've had them at uh, speak when we've been over at the Netherwood on, uh, on, on many an occasion. Uh, Amanda is a specialist practitioner in occupational health and safety management with over 25 years occupational health experience managing health risks in a wide variety of different industries. She provides quality managed systems of work to the Faculty of Occupational Medicine's Safe Effective Quality Occupational Health Services, which is CQOSH standards. And Julian is a, a, a Bosch trained occupational hygienist, and he helps businesses achieve robust and practical health management using practical physical and procedural controls. He uses his experience and knowledge to encourage organisations to develop ongoing action plans to help mitigate against future risks. Julian's teaching experience has honed his communication skills so that he has a positive influence on employees' behavioural safety through kinesthetic coaching and employee engagement. So I'm delighted that we're able to, to hear from them this afternoon as they, as they talk to us more about health and risk management being an essential part of any organisation's health and safety strategy. So if I can hand over to you now, and uh, I sit back and enjoy. Thank you very much, Elsa, and thank you very much to the South um, Cumbria and uh, Lancashire Group for inviting us to say hi to you all this afternoon. Um, and it's a beautiful uh, sunny day here in Yorkshire, so I hope that you've got a, a lovely day over wherever you are uh, as well. So, um, as Elsa mentioned, I'm a specialist practitioner in occupational health nursing. I'm also a charter member of IOSH uh, and I am a member of the IOSH committee and it's wonderful to be here with you this afternoon. Julian um, and I will be doing the presentation. I'm going to be kicking off uh, and then Julian will explain a little bit more about himself as well. I'm just desperately looking for pictures of Julian on the screen over here so I can see what he's up to. <laughs> so you can see who wave at you. When Julian's in charge of the slides this afternoon, so I need to be able to see what he's up to. So <clears throat> if you'd like to uh, bob across onto the next slide, Julian, that'd be lovely. Thank you. Cool, as if I'm magic. So um, we were talking to you today about health risk management and it's something that's really close to my heart because um, when I first started out in occupational health, we used to do an awful lot of health surveillance and uh, we were screening for ill health. And I always think it's a little bit upside down, really. I, I feel like we should be actually focusing on uh, the management of health risks rather than screening for them. Um, and uh, the more I've gone into occupational health, the more I've been working within the profession, the more... I've been focusing on the management of health risks and making sure that we uh, minimise and eliminate and minimise so far as reasonably practical. Um, when I first started, it was all very about health and safety, and I'm really see pleased that we're seeing um, health come into the top of the agenda uh, more and more so these days. Uh, and it's always astounded me as to why we wouldn't be doing that, because we don't have um, the Safety at Work Etc. Act, uh, we have the Health and Safety at Work, at work Etc. Act. We don't have the Management of Safety at Work regulations. We have the Management of Health and Safety at Work regulations. So why wouldn't we be managing health risks? So there's no real change in the legal framework to what we used to use in, and there's no change in the way that we go about it. So we still go through... Um, the same five steps to risk assessment as we would do to any uh, health and safety risk. Um, it's about looking at what the health risks do we create and what steps do we take to manage those risks themselves. And if we don't actually have 
proper control over our health risks and uh, that we can't have a, a clear plan as to what we're going to do about it. So we need to understand what those health risks are. Julie, can you pop onto the next slide for me, please? So I just wanted to say, I tend to break, them, break those health risks down um, because we've got um, the risks to health from work, which we're all very familiar with, um, and if we go through them, we've got the asbestos, the respiratory, the skins, noise, vibration, musculoskeletal, lead, the cancers, and all the other bits and pieces that you would come across, all the weird and wonderful that you get on your cost risk assessments. Um, they are the ones that I would say are our bread and butter ones. But I think the risk that we tend to miss are the risks um, caused by health problems within the working environment. And so it's about being able to understand what those risks are at work from specific health issues. And these are how we tend to sort of lump them together because actually these then become fitness for work issues really. So have we got any risks in our working environment if we've got any sudden change in consciousness level, altered awareness, a lack of judgment or insight, for example. So it can go from anything from safety critical workers to people working with children, Poor visual acuity and colour vision, we tend to associate with drivers or electricians, but, you know, uh, we're still seeing people like crossing patrol people that nobody's checked the vision to make sure they can see. Um, have we got uh, any jobs where there's uh, specific risks associated with poor communication? If there are emergency situations that you need to communicate on uh, very clearly, is there some concerns in relation to those? So, you know, hearing, speech, uh, can you be, can you communicate over to a radio if we do need to do that? Is there issues with poor grip strength? Not normally. <laughs> My door. Not normally, um, but if we have got somebody that's working at heights and they're dropping pieces of equipment on somebody's head, they may be saying yes, that there is a particular issue in relation to that. People with balance issues, people have been playing football on the weekend and they've no longer got a full um, use of one limb or the other as a result of that. Um, are people able to respond in an emergency should they need to? And I think one of the things that have come up more recently is what we're doing about infections and how can we manage that from a working environment? What are they doing externally? Um, if they're coming in with an infection, it may not just be COVID-19, but it might be the next kind of COVID that comes in. We might end up with a COVID-21, God forbid. Um, or, you know, going back to the traditional ones that we've seen over the years associated with the healthcare industry of hepatitis, HIV, chicken cock, pox, measles, mumps, rubella, those types of issues. Um, can we go to the next slide, please, Julian. So we need to be looking at this idea of uh, eliminating the risks to health from work. And going through those risk assessment processes, it, we shouldn't be jumping straight into health surveillance. We should be minimising those risks so far as reasonably practicable. There's certain ones that are easier to do than others. So if we're working in an engineering background, for example, there's a really strong possibility we can get rid of the risk from hand-down vibration by careful management. And that's probably the easiest one, in my opinion, to be able to manage. There are other areas where we, they, that can be done through the engineering standards uh, by engineering controls. But there are other areas like respiratory, we need to breathe. And it's really difficult to be able to control those uh, from a person perspective. So we need to be looking at controlling those at source wherever possible. So if we are looking at controlling from source, we need to make sure that the extraction ventilation that we're working with is doing the job that which we're wanting it to do. It might be meeting the specification of the extraction ventilation, but is it reaching the um, specification of the job? Is it eliminating the exposure to employees? And sometimes there's a mismatch with that, and it's important that we actually ask that question. Um, control measures may also be down to management training of individuals about safe systems of work that we're putting into place, 
These are not going to be new to you guys because you're used to putting in these into practice for safety issues. And we need to be looking at those from a health perspective as well. One of the interesting ones that I've been um, honoured to be working with, um, I want to say recently, but probably not because it was pre-COVID, was working with a funeral um, care company to look at the minimisation of musculoskeletal issues within that sector. And that's really quite challenging because you're taking the deceased into the care of the funeral directors um, from very strange places. You've got to handle them with dignity. You've got to handle them in uh, help the individuals get the, uh, the deceased in out of the, the strange places and into the care. Um, uh, and the manual handling challenges that come up with the musculoskeletal risks as a result of those can be very challenging at times. But then by sharing good practice, then we did recently discover things like uh, pointing the hearse downhill helps to reduce some of the effort required in loading the person into the, the hearse. So it's about understanding the types of risks and sharing best practice between the team sometimes, and we can create management controls through those types of practices. <clears throat> Employee measures, um, I'm not a lover of PPE, but it is there as a last resort, but it is a, um, a very um, <clears throat> difficult one to manage. We constantly have problems with respiratory protection and people having face fit testers, uh, growing five o'clock shadows, um, whether they're cleaning them. We had um, recent examples of uh, welders that decided to keep their air fed pods on the desk so that they get filled with grinding um, uh, particles and then they put the mask back on again. So, you know, they need to understand that it's not just about putting the thing on, it's about making sure that the care and the maintenance and that sort of stuff's in place. Health surveillance is important. It, without a shadow of a doubt, it is important. And I would say to you that you need to make sure that you are getting a quality service in place to make sure that they are meeting the standards that are required. We see standards um, of varying levels within this profession. And, um, you know, sometimes for me, it can be quite scary. Uh, I've recently taken on a new member of staff um, who has been mortified because she has never in three and a half years of working in occupational health been shown how to check a verification of a spirometer. Um, and so when she started work with us, we're having to go through all that training with her so that she is providing quality services and that the spirometry she, she's using is measuring what it should be measuring. But as employers, we are responsible for what we're purchasing. So when you're purchasing occupational health, you need to make sure that the standards that are being applied are fit for purpose. Make sure that the people that are doing the work that you do, that they're doing, are competent to do so. CQOSH is the easiest way of being able to check that because somebody else is doing all that audit for you. But if you're struggling as a business and you need to go for a, a, a more economical approach, there are people that are operating as occupational health services that are very, very good, uh, that haven't gone through the CQOSH standards, but they are competent to do so, but you have to do that check yourself. So making sure that they are working under the supervision of the specialist practitioner or an occupational physician, making sure that the qualifications of the staff are there and that they're trained and they're supervised and that they are DBS checked and they have had all the uh, relevant professional updates and all the rest of it. As, a, as an organisation, as an employer, you're responsible for making sure that those checks are in place. Following your health surveillance programme, it's important to make sure you get management information back. What does that management information look like? Does it, you know, if you're getting that feedback, is it coming through individually or is it coming back as a group um, uh, presentation? So you know what percentage of your organisation has got noise-induced hearing loss, skin problems, respiratory problems. It helps you, that information then helps you to inform your strategy over what's next. Okay, Julian. Thank you. The next thing that we need to look at is those risks. 
from uh, at work from health. So individual risk assessments may be required to make sure whatever their specific health issue is, is making them safe to work. Do they need adjustments to the role? Do they need redeploying into a different role? Are there specific fitness to work standards that you need to put in place for your organisation based on your risk assessment? People will talk to you about disability discrimination and as a health and safety officer, you need to make sure that your HR people have got evidence on which you are basing that discrimination. If you are saying to people, if you have epilepsy that's not controlled, I do not want you working at height, that's quite reasonable. We can all see that that's quite reasonable. But where is it in your risk assessments and where is it in your occupational health strategy that evidences that risk assessment? Have you got that in place? From a control perspective, there are engineering controls that we can put in place to support people. And it may be that there is specialist equipment and specialist equipment may come from anything from uh, ergonomic mice to make sure people are getting carpal tunnel syndrome through to personal fire alarms because their hearing deficit is not allowing them to hear your hearing, your, your audible alarm. You need to look at that individual risk assessment and see what control measures can be put in place to help them. From a management perspective, if people have got communication problems that we were talking about before, do we need to put buddy systems in place so that somebody working with them? So if we've got a hearing problem and somebody's working at the side of a high speed road, for example, um, if they've got a buddy and there is an alarm going off, they can actually make sure that they are responsible for helping the person with a hearing deficit. Do you need to do one-to-one -one training with an individual because they have got dyslexia or specific learning needs? Are your procedures actually visual so that people with multiple languages can understand them and be able to apply them? Or are they in writing? Is your, are they actually applicable to the reading ages that you've got on site? Are you reviewing them on a regular basis to make sure that they're suitable and sufficient? From an employee measures point of view, you need to make sure that you, within your risk assessment for that individual, have placed a specific responsibility on the individual to ensure that they report any fluctuations in health that would then make that risk assessment invalid. So, so the things need to happen. Have they got further uh, deterioration in their health that makes that no longer relevant? Have they a health improved because we've had surgery and that now that's no longer relevant and they're able to return to normal tasks? It's important that you've got those reviews in place so that you can see that that's continually um, appropriate. You also may need to look at, there will be times when uh, an individual's health will deteriorate to the point where they are no longer able to do a job safely. And your risk assessments are there to demonstrate that fitness to work criteria so that they can go between fit, being fit for work and not fit for work. We will try not to go through a dis uh, disability discrimination claim and risk assessment needs to substantiate the decisions that have been made by health and safety, by HR, sorry, and the occupational health team, and they need to be communicated well. So if we can't put a redeployment opportunity in place, then that needs to be based on the capability and they cannot be capable of doing that job safely under these specific circumstances. So you can see how it's really important to make sure individual risk assessment uh, and health risks and how they impact on the working environment is taken into account. Julian? So if you've got all that information together as part of your health risk assessment, we then need to put that together in an occupational health policy. I've given you some headers there for you to take away with if you wanted to, so that you can make a decision about what you're going to put into your policy. These are the ones that I tend to put on our blank ones so you can fiddle around with them to make sure that they're appropriate for you. But what is it that you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to uh, achieve um, uh, that nobody gets ill health as a result of work? Are you trying to achieve that we're going for 
uh, zero tolerance on drugs and alcohol. Are we trying to say that we um, uh, we want to minimise the risk of work-related ill health? What is it that you're wanting to do? That goes in your strategic intentions, and it's no different from your health and safety strategic intentions. And my thoughts are: don't reinvent the wheel. Should it all in the same one of you uh, if you want to do so? The health assessment of health risks. I tend to put in, in from a, a health risk matrix perspective um, because it's easy and it's quick to update. It's a very, very useful tool if you ever go out to tender for um, a document for, for occupational health. It feeds into your uh, health and safety committee. It's really useful for dissemination of information in, within your teams because if you've got your teams identified within there, and their health risks are identified on that matrix. It's very difficult not to hit that from your individual risk assessments and so on and so forth. But I do find a health risk matrix particularly useful. From a protection of health perspective, are you going to be doing air monitoring, air noise monitoring? Are you going to do that annually? Are you going to do it um, two or three yearly? Are we going to put the control measures in place? Are we putting PPE in place? What are the residual risks? Is the health surveillance program we put it in place? Do we have fitness to work standards that go in place? What information, instruction and training are we putting in for who as a result of that? That all hangs on your health risk matrix. But what also, what are you going to do from a protection of health for the investigation of disease? We go on site and we do health surveillance and you will be astonished at how many companies want you to do health surveillance, but they get upset if you find anything. You'll be astonished at how many people want you to do fitness to work assessments, but then get upset if somebody isn't fit for work. You have to accept it as an organisation that that kind of feedback can happen. If you're asking the questions, you are potentially going to get an answer you don't want. But you need to understand that if, if that is a question you're asking, you need to have a what happens if plan in place as well. From a promotion of good health is concerned, um, I am seeing a lot of companies wanting uh, health and wellbeing strategies being put into place because of requirements of principal contractors. And I would say to you, Good health and safety and good HR gives you good health and well-being. Okay, you have got compliance obligations to put first and foremost. That needs to be there. You need to take steps to put your prevent your exposures and adequately control your residual risks as a first and foremost. If you put that in under your promotion of health then we shouldn't be looking at uh, all the other little bits and pieces, which I call pink and fluffy, and I'm sorry I haven't changed over the years, I'm still calling them pink and fluffy. The law requires us to take steps to prevent and adequately control risks. Helping workers tackle wellbeing issues like smoking and diet may be beneficial, but it's not a substitute for your legal compliance. And if you put in, in information to your board of directors that say we need to focus on health and well-being, then look at your, your statistics, look at the reasons for your sickness absence. If your reasons for sickness absence are stress and musculoskeletal, we need to be putting in a programme to actually um, focus on those, target those issues, rather than going for the smoking and the diet issues that are just popular because they're just picked off the shelf. You have to excuse me if that causes offence. I don't mean it to. I just feel quite passionate about that one, really. So, how are you managing your health risks? Have a look at what they are. What are you going to do about it? What strategies are you being put into place? Who are you reporting to them to? How do you know if they're successful? All of that information needs to be put within your policy. Look at your sickness absence management. Have you got a sickness absence management policy or do you need to put a few paragraphs within there about fitness to work, becoming a capability, redeployment opportunities within there? Are you going to have a separate drugs and alcohol policy? Are you not going to look at it because it's too hard? Or are you going to put it within your occupational health, uh, health and wellbeing policy as well? Are you going to provide a confidential support service? Is it going to be an EAP or are you going to just suggest that you will put something in place if an employee reports something? 
And if you've got all of this information coming in and if you've got individual health risk assessments going on, you also need to think about management of occupational health records. They're your health records. How long are you storing them for? It needs to be added within your uh, data protection policy about where that information is going to be sitting within your um, uh, data order. Uh, do you mean if you'd like to flip on? Next. So for those of you that have not seen this before, this is a health risk matrix. We adopted this, it came originally in, in a similar format from the Constructing Better Health standards. For those of you are not aware, Constructing Better Health is no longer with us, so we um, are having to do everything off our own framework again. Uh, I still think it's a valuable tool, however, this just shows us the hazard down the left hand side, it's only half the table so that you can read it. Uh, and then what we use this for is, is if you've got those issues on the left hand side, then you might need to tie up with the stuff across the top of, the, uh, top of it. So that includes everything from uh, doing your health risk assessment and policy, your visual field through to your health risk assessments, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Next slide please. And this is just a worked example. We use these when we're starting with new customers so that we can look at what services that they need. And we put numbers in there because as you get the numbers across the bottom, it's really easy to work out what the contractual requirements are so we can get a better quote. But uh, you don't need to put numbers in there. It, you know, it's just a way of monitoring who needs what we're doing and what we've got the problems where. Um, so next slide, I think I'm over to you now, Julian. Oh no, it's me again. Beg your pardon, thank you, Grace. Um, so what I don't want you to do is paperwork for the sake of it. You can't stand paperwork for the sake of it. Um, you know, these things that we're talking about, the health risk assessment, the occupational health policies, are there for your use, really. And I think a really good policy should be used. It shouldn't be just something that's printed out and is pretty on the sack of the shelf in the corner for the next time the insurance company comes in to do an audit. But it is there if the HSC come in and say, what are you doing about this? And it says, I've been doing this about this, and this is the evidence of that, and I can demonstrate that because this is what my health and safety committee notes does, and this is what my risk assessment stuff does, and it all ties together along those lines. So it's a fantastic opportunity to say, this is our strategic intention, this is how we've implemented it, this is the evidence of implementation, this is how we've reviewed it. So it's demonstrating compliance. It is good for claims defence. If you've got all the health, um, health risk matrices in there uh, and you want to use that, you know, in, in 10, 15 years when some of the health issues, work related health issues start to become apparent, then we can use that. It's there for clarification of standards within your business so that your HR and your health and safety are talking together very, very clearly. You know what you're dealing with. It can be useful for accreditation purposes if you're going for 45,001 or even 45,003 if we're getting ahead of ourselves. It's also a very helpful document for tendering. Um, I've been interested to read and be involved in more tender, tender applications over the last 18 months to two years. And it is surprising that a document as, as uh, important as a tender document where you are specifying what you need sometimes just comes out of a copy paste from somebody else. I have seen organisations give us a tender document that is actually based on an NHS tender document and they are not doing exposure prone procedures, trust me. You wouldn't want it to see an exposure prone procedure going in, in uh, being done in an engineering environment, guys. It's just not clean. But that's what's happening. So use these documentations to actually set up your own tender document. Use somebody else's framework by all means, but you do need to actually determine what it is that you're wanting to use specifically. They're also there and a really useful tool for audit because if this is what we're setting off to do, this is what we've actually come out with. We can then look at the implementation, we can look at the evaluation, and we can actually go back and say, have we actually hit what we're setting out to do. So it's not paperwork for the sake of paperwork. It can be used as a really, really valuable document. And over to you, Julian. Right, okay. Thank you very much, everybody there. Let me just get my screen moved on. You want me to so, do the Annika Rice bit now? Yeah, you might have to, but I'll give you plenty of uh, cues. 
So this is, uh, as I go out on site, I, I use this health risk matrix as a, a key document, apart from just being compliant with uh, COSH regulation uh, 11 there, it's just such a useful document. But this is kind of what I, I can hear back from occasions, you know, so, so what, you know, why do I need to do this? So I think the best way we can look at this is to look at a case study. Um, because this will help demonstrate why this document is so import, uh, important too. So I'm going to share with you um, two um, uh, occupational health reviews. Uh, this is a health surveillance review. And um, on the left, we've got a, a, a long function review from uh, 2019 to 2020. And on the right, obviously, we've got the year af after that 20 to 21. So when we come to look at this review, which is very good practice to do and to get your occupational health provider to do this and you'll, you will under, understand why. So when you look at the actual blue part of the pie chart there, that's referring to no problems identified or, you know, it's a pass for your long function test, your spirometry there. And then obviously we've got the amber, which is your temporary or ab. ab abnormalities detected and um and then obviously we've got the did didn't attend or could or or, or were unable to perform the test now it's quite ob obvious when you look at that pie chart that that blue is actually quite good blue means that our employees are being well looked after and in actual fact they're in a healthier place at the end of the shift when they started but when you compare the two and especially if we start to analyze the figures, we can actually see um, that from 2020 to 2021, we've got a decline of people who are coming through with no problems identified there. And we've got more people being uh, uh, picked up on uh, uh, temporary passes or reviews, or we're detecting something. And if you look at those figures carefully, it's uh, you know we can take we can look at the, the the actual numbers of 52 to 40 and you can say well that's just 12 people we've got new people starting and you know and we've got new and people leaving so there's a bit a bit of statistical uh deeper and uh analysis one can do but if you look at the percentage there so a drop from 70 67 percent to 54 percent is actually quite a significant a significant drop so this was a uh, live case so let's just go back then to cosh regulation 11 when we're looking at health surveillance there now these are the objectives it, why we do health surveil uh, surveillance there and i think we're all familiar with those but i want you to draw you to the last one uh, which is it's health surveillance is just one of those it's another tool we can use to check that our control measures are working effectively. So when we're looking at this and we have this review, you can see, well, in actual fact, something's not quite right. So um, let me just go through. The actual cause to this was a peak exposure. Uh, and that's what we sorted out. And that's where we've now, hopefully this year, we'll see an, Im a, 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 an improved sort of uh, uh, pass rate with a long function test there. But just to go back a bit, that's the uh, cause. When we looked at the air monitoring, it was showing that the exposure was actually under 20%. So some workers, employees were exposed to 1%, others were exposed to 18. So we had this range and that was done over an eight hour shift. So if you were to just to take that one piece of information there, you'd actually think, well, my air monitor says I'm actually doing really quite well. It's actually the LEV was was assessed religiously every year. Some of the LEV was assessed uh, twice yearly in accordance with the regs there. So again, you could look at that. Yeah, my air, air monitoring is low, my local exhaust ventilation. Well, I get that assessed. And actually, as we would walk around, we'd see it being correctly used too. That's a whole new talk on the effective use of LEVs there. And then we've got which is a great one to listen to if there was no real employee feedback on discomfort you'll be fully aware that you'll know of certain professions you've got uh, uh certain sort of fields of work 
uh, like to voice their concerns about their discomfort, perhaps more on a regular basis, but these are really good to listen to. It's good employee feedback. And also we, we looked at all, all face fit testing, all staff issued with a tight fitting uh, RP unit was face fit tested there. So when you were to look at that, you'd think, well, I think I've actually got it covered and I think I'm doing well. But it was the actual, the health surveillance review, which flagged up this potential concern. And so um, what I'd like to do now is, is to uh, act, actually just talk about, well, how do we actually identify peak exposure? Just to come back to that previous slide though, you can see health surveillance doesn't stand on its own, nor does air monitoring, nor does all the other checks. It, it, it has to be, uh, 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 everything has, has, has to be looked at there. So you might all be sat there thinking, well, how on earth do I look at uh, uh, peak exposure? How do I identify it? I always like to feel when we do these talks that uh, we'll leave you with one or two tools. You can go back to your uh, places of work and uh, try out. We'll, there will be some live camera action soon. Okay, so really when we talk about methods to identify peak uh, ex exposure there are, are these ones. I think the most common one is the dust lamp technique. There's an actual um, uh, uh, guidance in the HSC and that's just taken straight from the HSC where we're shining a beam of light across. And we're gonna just look at that in uh, practical terms. So that's a very good tool for you to have. You buy yourself a very strong torch. You can, there's all sorts of recommended for torches out there. And uh, you can go down in your work, in your workplace, shine your beam of light across where somebody's working and you can actually observe what's going on. A key factor this is, um, if you notice there, it's talking about a five to 15 degree angle to the beam of light, which is going across. Now that angle is quite import, important there. If you go to sh shallow, you'll end up with the light in your eye and you have to start to sh shield it and you'll miss some. And again, if you go uh, beyond 15 uh, degrees there, it, 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 it can be, um, again, you won't perhaps pick up as much of the dust as you can. Also, we've got real-time dust monitoring. Uh, this is more of an expensive option than the torch, but this is really good. This is actually a, a company working on a town hall in the north and you can just see there by the monitor there it's uh, it's, it's reading the average is 2.5 milligrams per cubic meter there and um, you can see there's some on the actual screen there's some peaks which are at 10 uh, milligrams per cubic meter there and we know they're working on sand sandstone and we know that 80 percent of sandstone is going to be respirable crystalline silica so we know that person's got a really high peak exposure now Obviously, you see he's wearing a tight fitting face mask and he's not particularly clean shaven, but uh, which is obviously not given a good seal. And this will lead to that sort of peak exposure there. And then the final one is a, is a UV dye. Now, so whatever method or investigative method you use, it, this actually provides, if you take your photographs or your videos too, this actually provides uh, 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 great sources of training aids for your toolbox talks. You know, imagine doing the dust lamp technique, showing somebody how to, if, how what the effective range on an LEV is, and you're showing that to them, and they can actually see that this this works really well. So, what I'm going to do is first of all is jump straight down to real time dust monitoring and share with you um, a, a, a live case we had here. This is real time dust monitoring. This was working in a, a uh, environment where there was a high use of flour. That was the main source ingredient there. Obviously, in the top right hand corner, I've got the workplace exposure limit at 10 milligrams per cubic meter. Now, with flour, we also have a short term stell, which is the how much we uh, how how much uh, the limit we can't go over in a 15 minute period. So that's 30 milligrams per cubic meter. Now, this next statement underneath is respiratory sensitizers. That's one of the annotations in AH40 there. But the next line is, is from our respiratory uh, physician there who says occupational asthma risk will increase with peak exposure. So we're looking at a peak expo exposure. And this is just how um, um, 
a peak exposure can can impact on your empl employees health so we can see here we're not actually doing anything we're just taking the mixing bowl down and this is great so we've got a nice green face there because we're actually not just under the limit there we're about 0 0.1 milligrams per cubic meter bearing in mind flowers are a respiratory sensitizer and this has to be as low as we can get it in my book if it's zero that's really good okay and therefore we've got a bit of playing around we're, we're going to take the bowl out we're going to clean that and you can see a few bumps coming up there so we're just not quite uh, hitting one milligram per cubic meter, but you can just see that these these sort of bumps we've, we've got coming up at the uh, 21 minutes past 10 mark, it's, it's started to go. And then we start to mix in the dry ingredients and we suddenly in that space of 10 seconds shoot up to above the, um, occupy, the uh, well, the workplace exposure limit. And then this huge spike, we're even above the short term uh, STEL, uh, 15 minutes uh, short, short term exposure limit there. In about five seconds, we are currently at 36 milligrams per cubic meter. So you might think that's the process. Yeah, but that's a short STEL and it drops off quite quickly. But this um, peak exposure occurs when we're adding bulk dry ingredients. OK, now that period is roughly uh, 25 seconds per mix. So if I look at this from a sort of uh, mathematical uh, perspective, peak exposure is 25 seconds per mix. That's above the well. One mix every 15 minutes. That's four times an hour. And that's actually that peak exposure occurs 24 times in one shift. So put it into numbers, 50 minutes per day. And then we've got um, of peak exposure. We've then got 75 minutes per week. And then if you look at it over a year, there's 53 hours per year of peak exposure that employee could be faced with. So when you're thinking about your processes there, this is a, this is a really good example to get you to think about, well, what are my peak exposures? Is it the pouring? Am I adding dry ingredients? Am I getting a peak exposure and I'm patting my bags down? Am I getting a peak exposure and I still see these out on site of sweeping brushes too? So am I sweeping up at the end of the day of fabrication where I'm just put, putting uh, chromium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, uh, whatever we have in our, in our welding rods there back into that person's breathing space? So this is real-time dust monitoring, a really effective tool. It's a rather expensive tool to have. Uh, there's models out on the market. I think mine was something like three and a half thousand uh, pounds. And uh, but there are more expensive ones which will uh, actually highlight what the sub substance is going through. You talk about tens of thousands, a bit more there. Lots of com companies out. And obviously, if you want to chat outside of the meeting, I can share with you my my personal views on which uh, equipment I like to use. OK, so that's real time dust monitoring. What I'd like to do, I've just gone to the wrong screen there. What I'd like to do now, I'm just catch up. Me and technology sometimes don't sit quite well, is move to the live cam. So if I just go here, I'm going to stop sharing and um, I'm going to move to, to the live cam. So. That's what I'd like to do, if you can all see me on your screen, is just, just do a very quick practical demonstration with the uh, dust lamp technique here. So bear with me, please. So I've got myself a nice um, tray of flour. Let me just point my camera down. So can you all see my uh, flour there? That's sat on my desk. So what we're going to do first is I'm going to actually just add a little bit, bit, bit of force. It's just an empty container, right? And what we're going to do is I'm just going to put a bit, bit of force in and you should be able to see some clouds of dust. There we go. Lovely clouds of dust flicking around and you can see that quite well. I'll do a few more so you can just ha have a look. It's great. There it is. It's going uh, around. Now that's great. But let's just see what we can see with the dust lamp technique. So I'm going to get my torch here and I'm going to shine it across the actual beam. This is where I need Amanda to go and turn my office lights off for me, please. 
You might hear Amanda run run across. Uh, there she is. She is off. She'll probably get stopped on the way for questions being asked. Okay, perfect. So we've got the that that off. You can see my torch being. Oh God bless you. She's running back to the office there. So let's see where we are now. I've got a nice torch beam. And so can we see, can you see the torch beam light? Just what's going on? Now this is quite interesting because when we saw that, uh, uh, okay, when you actually saw the initial dust without the torch beam, you just saw it go up and then it quickly came down. But now you can still see, I can see this on my camera. I hope you can see it on yours. I've still got quite a lot of flower particulate matter floating in the air. So I'll just raise that torch a bit higher there, so you can see the, the, the torch being coming a, a cross. That's roughly, I would say about uh, between those two is about 15 to 20 centimeters there. So I'll, I'll spray that A again. I'll just get a nice uh, uh, bump. You can still see in the torch beam. So we're just gonna be a force and there we go. And you can just actually see in that beam. Now, can you see how it's actually moving too, how it's swirling around? And that's what we need to be looking at too, is like, it's not that we just got particulate matter into the air, but what we've also got is um, the actual nature of it. So I'm just gonna try and get some more beams a, a across. Sometimes what you can do is just move it around so you can see it's swirling. And this is quite, actually, when you use this as a toolbox aid, especially for welders, um, it works well if you've got, it uh, works well with flour, but it also works well if you've got uh, if you've got a, a, a joinery department or you're actually within the joinery type of work. Uh, it's very good to actually demonstrate why this sort of extraction is really good. But it's good for you guys too to walk around your uh, workplaces with a torch looking for that peak ex exposure. So that's just the, the dust lamp technique with a torch. Um, and obviously I've used flour there. What I'd like to move on to you now is I'd like to move on to you the use of UV dye. And um, uh, the, it does come with a health hazard. You can see my desk. Oh, this is quite an interesting one. Uh, you can see my desk here where I've got the ring of flower. Oh, and this is my keyboard. OK, so you can see my keyboard's full of dust, too. And this also goes to demonstrate just how much it stays in the air and fall into other areas too. So the person you perhaps got working here, full face mask on, RPE, very well protected, but the person working uh, through this side there, I'm trying to draw across from the desk, he might not have his RPE on, and that's actually what we'll class as a peak exposure. Okay, so let's move on to UV dyes. Now, all those are feeling a bit car sick, as I move the camera around, that's fine. Amanda, could I have the lights on, please? If you can, Amanda's going to quickly shoot through and put the lights on. I can hear, can hear Amanda go. I'm just going to move my camera down, so bear with me there. And what I'd like you to do is I'm going to introduce you to Bob. Okay. Now, this is Bob, right? Uh, Bob works in a CNC uh, lathe uh, machine shop. And uh, Bob spends, uh, I would say, 95% uh, 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 of his time um, standing in front of the, the machine while this CNC lathe spins around. Uh, we've got atomized working metal fluids there and, um, and basically um, it's an enclosed unit too, but with no LEV um, uh, uh, extraction on there. So Bob's job is to take a tool part out and to put it back in. Now, I want you to think about the pressure build up in inside there. So I'm going to build the pressure up. So the minute Bob opens the door, we've got positive and negative pressure and it's going to try and equally balance itself out. I just want to point out before we go on, I just want you to notice uh, Bob's got his uh, hand sanitizer next to door to, to him there. So Bob's going to open the door. Now, what we do say, uh, it, well, what, what we do say is, have a delay when you open your doors you know we've got to let your extraction work and you've got to pull out you've got to be careful because as soon as you open the doors your head goes in and also the use of compressed air lines there now in here in this pressurized unit i've got i've actually got um uh, uv dye now you can get all sorts of U uv dye this really only works if you've got if if you're if your if your production 
uh, will allow will allow UV dye on. This is a, uh, but this is actually, if you think about it, a really good training aid for all machine ops there. So I've just got some. Uh, we use it in the motor indus industry there. I've just got some ring uh, dye, and what we do is we tend to put that through engines, uh, coolant systems there, just to see if we've got any leaks developing uh, along the way. So what I'm going to do, Bob's working. The cycle's finished. I'm actually going to now release and open the door, which is this, and so we can see. And uh, you probably didn't see that spray, but as I press that, there's a bit of spray came out there. So what I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna get my black light torch. Amanda, sorry to do this. And there's only one more light turn off and turn on again. Uh, could you turn the light off please? And I'm gonna actually go and see Bob. So here goes Amanda. That's got Amanda steps in for the day. So here we go. I've got a nice picture of Bob. Wait until Bob comes into focus. I'm going to shine the ultraviolet light on. And you can see there. So I just go to the corner, pull back a back, back a bit. You can actually see if you look close, it's oh gosh, it's been out of focus that. Sorry guys, see if you can get it to focus in. Um you can see the, the light's got a lot on his face, he's got quite a bit on his chest, and you can actually see some come down onto his arms there. So you can see the bits which are glowing in the actual black light, but there's quite a bit on Bob's face. Let me go and put that camera back up there on the top. Now, obviously using UV dye does come with a, a, a very strict health warning there. You just need to make sure that you've uh, got, uh, uh, you know, it's safe to use. So you can just flash on Bob A again here. Um, obviously you can see there, you can see the, where it's all shining, it's got it on his arms. And he's got it on his uh, um, skin. Actual fact, this is a very good training tool using something like Bob when you're talking to your mach your machinists there and other places where we've got high pressure tops. So there's three sort of quick takeaways you could use. Let me just share my final screen. Um, and, and I like to feel that you, you, you can take that back to your workplace. Get, get yourself a torch and just walk around looking and trying to identify high uh, uh, or peak exposure or parts of your process which can produce a peak exposure there. Now I'm going to leave you with a final um, uh, uh, warning too um, and I was preparing for this last last night we've got a few uh, works going around our house up at home so I thought I'd step out I'll get my UV dye in and have a great time. So after I got all the pressurized container done I thought I'll just see what's on my hands and just got my screen up here. And that's what I found on my hands. That's a shot from a very minimal amount. That's for me just screwing off the lid. And if you think about it, that's quite a um, thought provoking photograph. My contact with that tub was minimal, but that's what's on my hands. And then Amanda shouted at me saying, what on earth are you doing? Okay, what crazy, what crazy experiment are you doing? And have you got it anywhere in the house? Of which I said, no. But then when Amanda went to bed that night, I did go around the house and there we go. I found some on our door handles and uh, obviously the corrosion, it isn't me. It's probably the, U, the UV dye. So these are really quite a, a, a sort of a launching off into a, another talk when we're talking about skins, uh, the impact on skins and uh, health risks uh, and, and using our health risk management to make sure we keep our guys safe. Well, that's all from me. Um, I'm going to stop presenting and, and, and uh, stop talking. I hope you've enjoyed that. And uh, and uh, if there's any questions, I think it's over to you, uh, Elsa. Oh no, over to Patrick, I think, who's going to liaise on the questions there. Um, I suggested that Amanda, Amanda should, and you should manage the Q&A together because it seems sensible. You really, you definitely know your stuff. <laughs> you Bless you, thank start. you. Okay, do we have some questions? Yep, sorry, that was me. I was just saying, I want, yeah, my question is, is have you cleaned up in the kitchen after you've got that UV dye all over? Um, um, potentially, yes. <laughs> that's a no, I can understand that one. Right, so I've got a few questions coming through from the chat. The first one is from Raza Sadar. 
who says, uh, with the current COVID-19 situation, is it enough just to do a verbal stroke checklist assessment of an individual instead of an actual spirometry test? Um, are you okay if I pick up on that one, Julian? Yeah, it's fine. It's great. Cool. Um, okay, so what the HSC did give us the opportunity to do was to say, uh, don't do your normal health surveillance for 18 months. You can delay it up to 18 months as a result of that. Um, there is a, a school of thought that says spirometry questionnaires are probably the most important part of any respiratory surveillance. And there are so, some companies that have just been doing spirometry questionnaires and that's it as a result of that. My personal opinion, uh, and it's not in the HSE anywhere, isn't this, is, is that um, from a personal, uh, personal perspective, the majority of the stuff that we're seeing is on, on uh, reporting of symptoms. The other thing that we're looking for is a deterioration in the numbers that we're seeing from uh, the amount of air blown out in the first second and the amount of air blown out overall from the point of maximal inspiration to the point of maximal expiration. If we don't do spirometry, we can't pick up on that. So to have a, a, a checklist done on a spirometry test, yes, if you can't get your health surveillance done proper, um, fully, I would say in a high risk environment, you should be doing the spirometry by now. Um, you know, so if you're exposing them to astrogens, I would always say do your spirometry because the shape of the spirometry itself will tell us if we've got some kind of uh, obstructive airways pattern starting. So uh, is it just enough? And I think it will go back down to do your risk assessment. If it's a residual risk, if it's a very low residual risk, if it's an irritant and not a sensitizer, you can probably get away with doing the spirometry questionnaire. Uh, if you are exposing people to uh, occupational asthmogens or even skin allergens that are being made airborne to the point where you could inhale them, I would say you need to be going back to spirometry by now. We've been doing spirometry now since July last year to key workers um, with all the uh, appropriate uh, protection in place. Um, and we, we went back into doing the normal health surveillance uh, in, um, I think it was the September, October, no, October, November time, early November time last year. Um, and we had all the precautions in place for uh, airborne generating procedures as, as uh, advised by our professional body. Uh, there's no reason why you can't have that done now. Um, some people aren't doing them still. Uh, is a, it is a more expensive for us to provide it because we've got to have all the PPE in place. We've got to have uh, the viral filters and the different cleaning mechanisms in place. Uh, but, um, but there's no reason why you can't have spirometry back in place in your working environment um, with the safety to keep procedures in place um, for high risk estrogens. Um, I hope that answers the question. Is that okay for you, Reza? Can't see him. Okay, can't hear either. Uh, I've got another question here that says, whilst conducting a health risk assessment, I'm implementing a risk uh, health management programme in order to be proactive and preserve health of our employees. We risk sometimes to miss the first stage of disease or alterations. This is due to most companies are following legal guidance on, on surveillance frequencies, usually yearly or semesterly, and this will compromise the suitability of our risk assessment. Is there any ideas to keep the health risk uh, assessment more efficient? Julian, do you want to tackle that one? Uh, yes, um, you know, I, I, I spoke about the health surveillance is, um, is, is one part of the big picture there. Um, and so, um, yes, you are right. But if you feel that your, um, your um, field of work requires more frequent health survey, surveillance, then, then what you have to do is risk assess, uh, assess that too. So, uh, you know, you can look for more frequency uh, of, um, of um, health surveillance. And let's take an example. You've got people working in welding, but they're working in the nuclear industry. So there's a sub substance in there, which is cobalt, which will trigger uh, uh, workplace occupational asthma and, and, and trigger as asthma across the board. If you're concerned that your control measures are, you can do more health surveillance. 
also with people who are using uh, isocyanates, which are floating freely uh, around in the air. So it's going to come down to your risk assessment and um, uh, and uh, the frequencies there. There are there is guidance on frequency of um, health surveillance, which you can do. Amanda, do you want to add anything to that? And the only other thing I would add on to that, guys, is if you are doing health surveillance and you're concerned about uh, the first stage of disease, then I would say to you, um, you need to step back a little bit because if we can do biological monitoring and biological monitoring is telling us that there is nothing in the air or there's nothing in the body, should I say, then we know that the control measures are there and they're working. If you have got the biological substances um, in your body, so if we're doing the biological monitoring and it's telling us the substances are there, then it's telling us that the control measures aren't working and we need to go back to the health risk management strategy. We shouldn't be waiting for occupational disease onset to be able to pick up whether our control measures are working properly or not. We should be checking those control measures ourselves. Health surveillance is there if there's a residual risk. So we need to be actually on board and keep repeating that, that, that attempt to reduce the exposure each time. We see that quite commonly done for vibration. We see it quite commonly done for um, respiratory stuff because you know breathing stuff makes me freak out. It's the stuff that you can't actually retire healthily if you can't breathe. Um, I don't often see a lot of effort, if I'm honest with you, put into controlling noise. It's very rare noise dampening exercises are put in place. So, you know, do have a think about what it is that you could do to reduce that exposure as much as you can. Uh, Julian, our fan Shahid says, um, Shahid had to say, I do apologise if I've got these names uh, pronunciations wrong, I sincerely do. Uh, with lots of SMEs coming around, how is this education being provided to those companies to create these documents before random assessments occur? The HSE, et cetera, are being stretched, so I see less proactive support and more re reactive correction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can see why you asked. I asked me to do that, that one there. <laughs> Look, you are actually, you are, you have at, actually raised a, a, a very valuable point. From my perspective, it is about education. It's about training these guys on what to to do. Um, I think it's down to the uh, health and safety teams working with those SMEs to actually direct them towards that and to and to uh, start to put those programs into place. I think from our perspective too, um, Amanda's given a list of those policies we need to be working towards and that health risk made. Uh, made uh, matrix there. I'm not, I, I find it hard to comment on the a, on the HSV one about being stretched. Uh, um, uh, I, I don't particularly. I don't know the exact numbers or, or, or what's going on there, but um, I, I do see a lot more FIFA uh, uh, sort of interventions going on. But then, if you think about it, taking it all the way back, if we can train our SMEs to um, follow Kosh. Because COSH, to me, people get quite scared. But if you read COSH, if you follow that procedure through COSH, we know we are protecting the, uh, the these people. And, you know, we're getting the right me measures in place, the right testing in place. It, it's all there. There's, you know, it, it, it's it's really good. But what I also would like to say, if you're working as a, consult, a consultant too, uh, every health and safety consultant needs a very friendly uh, occupational hygienist, possibly based in West Yorkshire, you know, just to talk from, from a random there, somewhere where you can pick the phone up and just say, um, do you know, I've got this customer and they're currently doing this, or can you have a look at this, or what's your thoughts, or they're brought on a new substance. The great one is um, uh, somebody rang up and said, oh, uh, I've got a customer who's got some picklin paste, you know, in, in our heads, the alarm bell is, is it the one which requires the antidote? So that sort of thing. So uh, it is difficult. I mean, more events like like this here too really count because the more people we get involved with these events, the more we raise uh, uh, awareness. I know Amanda and I like to give our time to these speaking events, especially smaller groups too. You know, you talk about your construction, your construction groups, your small construct con construction groups, because it is about getting the word out. Hope that answers your question, uh, Fan. 
a question from Claire Warman. She says, I can always find help for safety by the design, but trying to find support for health by design is virtually impossible. Is there anything the speakers could point us to, to a design uh, in health? Um, Julian? I think, I think Claire, I'm going to stick my two pen and flip in here, Claire. Claire, just pick up the phone, um, we're geeks. If we can help you, we will do. If we don't know, we've got a load of other geeks up our sleeves and we'll put you in, in touch with them. Um, you know, it, it costs nothing for us to, to come out and say hi to you or to have a chat with you on the phone. Um, but uh, I'm not 100%, there's such a, a wide range of different health issues um, and I wouldn't like to say, look, these are the people that you need to speak to. Um, but what I would say is, is that um, we've got a lot of people that we've drawn on uh, for different um, issues over the years. And uh, if we can't help, we'll certainly pass you on to the right one specific to your circumstances. And that offer goes out to any of you really. Um, pick up the phone or uh, send us an email and we'll help out wherever we can. Would you like to add anything to that, Julian? Yeah, just 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 to say, if you do need to do, do ring, do ring through, and um, obviously don't ring through to me directly because I never pick up my mobile phone. Uh, and if you talk to Amanda, she'll verify that fact. So you know, just ring through to the office there. There's a couple of numbers. We feel you know we're, we are all in this to together, and uh, we empathise with with some of you health and safety professionals because you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. And uh, it's about, as Amanda said, it's about knowing friendly geeks, especially those from West Yorkshire. Now, I'm going to apologise for pronunciation again. I've got a, a question here. Is it Karen Delaney? Um, it's a C-I-A-R-A-N, and I don't know how to pronounce that one, so I do apologise again. Uh, I wonder how many people are aware of the verdict recent tribunal case from Newcastle, the Kane versus Deb Matt, which has raised some very interesting issues, flagging this in relation to the drugs and alcohol policy. Um, I took a quick look at this one, um, Karen, um, and uh, I wasn't aware of it, so I'm really, really grateful for that. But the thing that smacked me throughout this is the need to follow procedure and make sure you, uh, you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's, because um, this looks like it's a case of a guy who's a driver who was off sick with COPD. And he was seen uh, whilst he was socially isolating in the social club having a few pints um, and he was dismissed and the, uh, held a uh, wrongful dismissal on the back of that um, and it looks like when I'm, I'm quickly reading through and I've only just read through while, while Julian's been talking uh, a few different issues in relation to the fact that the uh, prosecution uh, got dates mixed up um, so he was supposed to have had a phone call with the guy on, the, on, a, on a, one, a Tuesday and it was actually done on a Monday. Uh, there's a whole host of things about uh, where was there in the policy that said that going to the pub when you're supposed to be social isolating was gross misconduct um, it, when there was a query over that. So it does come down to following procedures, making sure you're dotting your I's and crossing the T's and making sure, again, like you would do any accident investigation, making sure you're following your accident investigation, you get all the evidence there, you're presenting it, um, and that you are um, uh, accurate with the information that you've done, you're following the policies and procedures. But if you haven't got the policies and procedures in place, uh, it'd be really hard to follow them. So uh, I might have missed something because I've only done a, about a two minute quick flip through the judgment, but um, if anybody would like to stick the two pen and, and comment further on that, please do. Anybody out there? You've all got your little mics off, your pictures are closed down, so I don't even know if they're actually still there or you could be uh, nice they, they be able to unmute themselves, but I've just given access now, so people can unmute themselves now. Hi guys, Hi, good Chris. to see you all. <laughs> Hi Tina. Right. Thanks so Hi Chris. Hi um, So I can't see any more questions coming through because I've, I've lost them, but is there anything else anybody else would like to... Oh, it's not... A, can, please accept my apologies, Mr Delaney. I do apologise. <laughs> I didn't know how to pronounce your name. <laughs> So just coming back, one or two people have done uh, privately uh, contacted us. I was just going to say one of them was, I need to know more about how a healthist matrix works. 
you know, I'll just reiterate what Amanda said was that, look, just give us a ring. You know, it's all about make, make, making sure we're working together as a profession that we are protecting these and uh, employees on site. Um, the best thing to do is you bring through to the office main line. You'll get through. Ask to speak to Kate. Say, oh, you, you know, you saw us talk at the Irish conferencing uh, 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 webinar in Cumbria there, and Kate will look at a range of times and 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 hopefully sort you, uh, you chaps out if 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 that's if you require more support on it. Cool. Well, thank you very much for all uh, listening in this afternoon. I'm going to pass you back to Elsa. I'm getting this sort of message saying, "Great presentation, can you shut up." Uh, although it was a little bit nicely dressed up in that one, but I got the message. So, Elsa, back to you. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not great at subtle, but, <laughs> but thank you. That has been a really, really thought-provoking uh, uh, presentation this afternoon, and I've, I've certainly put uh, put lots of notes down here, and I hope that has been helpful for uh, for all of our members as well this afternoon. Um, so thank you everyone for coming and thank you to, to Amanda and Julian for taking the time to put that presentation together for us and those uh, super demonstrations. Uh, we're taking a break in August and we'll be back for the um, 16th of September still on Zoom and at 1.30 again and that's going to be looking at PPE, CE markings and compliance and that's going to be from um, ARCO. So do join us for that and in the meantime have a safe and and restful summer uh, and hope the sun shines for you.